You will notice from your bulletin that there is a sermon insert which has the scripture text so you can follow along this morning <coughs> as I read. But also if you'd like to fill in the blanks, you can do that as well this morning. Easter, the rest of the story. Now some of you probably been staring up here wondering what all this other <coughs> stuff might represent. Well, allow me just to share a quick illustration, hopefully trying to bring the entire story together, the whole story, from Good Friday to this moment where we're celebrating Resurrection morning. You will discover that once I remove the silk handkerchief, that I have a block that represents Jesus Christ. It has crosses on the block, and also have an empty tomb. Over here I have a hat, we'll explain that in a few moments, because if you were to read John 1, 1, it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Let me kind of explain that to you. Before Jesus ever came to earth, he was in heaven with God. This hat over here, it's quite empty. In fact, for those that know me well, and my wife, they will all say I can put it on my head, it's still quite empty. I resemble that remark. However, the hat's going to represent heaven, so we're going to set it over here in the heavenlies. So according to John 1, 1, before the plan of salvation ever came to earth, it was right here in heaven. But we go on to read that in the fullness of time, in other words, when everything was just right, God sent forth his Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. Jesus came to express God's love for us. However, because his light exposed so much darkness in the lives of others, they demanded his death. And we know that, and we just celebrated Good Friday through religious rulers, Pilate, and the Roman government, they sentenced Christ to be crucified. Upon a cross, he died, giving himself for you and for me. But they also demanded that his body be placed in an empty tomb. And so what we're going to do right now is we're going to bring back that block, which represents Jesus Christ, and we're going to set it right here in the tomb. And they covered up, they sealed the tomb. And you might be able to hear the block as it travels between the corridors. It almost seems to me that Jesus wasn't confined by any stone in front of the tomb. However, he is there. He is there. But what happened on the third day? Do you folks remember? On the third but we're celebrating it, are we not? <laughs> it's Easter Sunday. We're celebrating that resurrection. And if that's the case, the block shouldn't be there. And look at that, it's not. Well, really, it's not. <laughs> you should have believed me the first time. Because what happened? The Bible says that he arose, he ascended into heaven, and now he sits at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for you and for me. And that hat represents heaven. Let's take a look. Ah, just as the scriptures declare, he is in heaven. He is victorious over sin over death, but over Satan himself. So follow along with me, if you would, as I read the scriptures for us this morning. From Luke 24, verse 6, and then 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20. Luke 24, 6. He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. And then jump into 1 Corinthians. But if it's preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are, not, we are found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God when we raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised, then if the dead are not raised, then Christ was not raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. 
If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. You know, as Pastor Judy said, I'm going to talk a little bit about memory, because memory can be a tricky thing, can it not? In fact, an old adage states, oh, how quickly we forget. However, I was relieved to realize I'm not the only one that has this problem. How many dare say you forget from time to time? We're all in good company this morning. In fact, according to Karen Bola, a Johns Hopkins researcher, she noted seven things that we're most often prone to forget. Let's start with number seven and move towards number one. Seven, whether or not you just done something. Now, let me add that. Whether or not you remember what you went into a room for. Did you go to get something? Were you to do something in that room? Um, and that's 38%. Faces. People just don't remember faces. This face, however, you can't forget. But 42% can't remember faces. Or what was just said? 49%. I will confess, because it happened just yesterday. My wife was a witness, because she's the one that was talking to me. And finally, she just paused and said, are you even listening to me? And I will say, I was honest. I said, no. <laughs> Things didn't go very well after that. However, 49% can remember what was just said. Or how about a word? There are certain words that sometimes we struggle with. We just can't capture what they are or remembering them yet beyond the moment. And telephone numbers, 57%. And today we don't even need to remember telephone numbers. With all of our smartphones, we just get the person we want to call and it calls them. The numbers are already logged in. Where something is, 60%. Almost forgot where my sermon was this morning. But, oh, I'm so glad that didn't happen. And then people's names, 83%. Now, I know that this story I share with you, although it's humorous, you've probably heard it before, but an older couple was having troubles with their memory. But they didn't want to, you know, hurt each other's feelings, so they came up with a plan. Let's write everything down so we'll know what our spouse wants. So if you ask me for something, I'll write it down, and therefore I'll be able to look at my notes and oblige. Well, one night, the wife turned to her husband and said, would you like anything? He thought for a moment, he said, you know, I would really like a large ice cream sundae with chocolate ice cream, whipped cream on top of the chocolate ice cream, and a cherry on top. She said, okay. So she started to head to the kitchen. He goes, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Aren't you going to write it down? Don't be silly, she said. I'm just going to the kitchen. I'll be back in a moment. Well. She was gone for quite some time. When she finally returned, she set out a large plate in front of him with hash browns, eggs, bacon, and a glass of orange juice. And he looked at her and said, I knew it. I knew you would forget. Where's the toast? <laughs> well, memory problems are nothing new. Listen carefully to what the scriptures have to say from Luke 24, 6. He is not here. He has risen. Then notice the next word. Remember. Don't you remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? The angels are saying, don't you get it? He was telling you the story all along. He was relaying what was about to happen. Don't you remember? Well, this morning I pray that the message will help you remember the best part of what took place on a horrible Friday. The rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. You know, it was June 18, 1815. It was the Battle of Waterloo. The French were under the command of Napoleon. And they were fighting against the British, the Dutch, the Germans, 
all under the command of General Wellington. Now, the people of England depended on a system of signals to find out how the war was progressing, to find out exactly what was going on. And one of those signals was on the tower of the Winchester Cathedral. Late in the day, the signal came across in a red Wellington defeated. And right at that time, fog swept over the city. They couldn't read the full message, but already their hearts were broken. They lost the war. Through the city, gloom had already taken place. Across the countryside, they were hearing the message, Wellington defeated. But after a while, the fog lifted. And they realized that they didn't see the whole message. The message had four words, not two. The complete message was, Wellington defeated the enemy. And with that, hearts began to rejoice. New news was spread through the city and along the countryside. Sorrow was turned into joy. Defeat was turned into victory. Why do I share this story? Because when Jesus was buried in the tomb, hope had died. It died among some of the followers, but it died even in the hearts of his most faithful disciples. After that frightful crucifixion, and you know, you and I cannot even begin to imagine what might have happened on that Friday when he was crucified. But there was the fog of disappointment that settled in. The fog of misunderstanding. And it crept over all of those that had a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, they could only read part of the message. Christ defeated. That's all they knew. But on the third day, the very day you and I are celebrating this moment, the fog had lifted and the world received the complete message, Christ defeated death. Sorrow has been turned into joy. Death has turned into life. So the moments we have remaining, I just want to share two facets of the Easter story. It is a story of good news, but also it's a story of hope. But let's begin with the good news. You know, one of the differences between Christianity and every other religion that is out there is that our founder is alive. And not only is our founder alive, he's doing quite well. Whereas their founders are all dead. At the tombs of Muhammad and Confucius and Buddha and all the others that have appeared on the scene, we will read, here he lies. But when you go to the tomb of Jesus, the words of the angel ring out in our ears. He is not here. He has risen. From 1 Corinthians 15, 14 we read, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. You know, the word gospel actually means good news. But if you take the resurrection of Jesus Christ out of the gospel, it's not good news. It's not really news at all. It's very sad to the heart. You're left with your brokenness, and you're left with your sins. You know, Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist of the 19th century, assigned a lot of his student ministers a task. They were to go through the streets of Chicago, set up some tent meetings, and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It gave them a chance to also preach and learn how to put their sermons together, but also the chance to win folks to Jesus Christ. Moody one night appeared at one of the tent meetings unannounced. And he said that the student did a good job as he preached. The young man expounded well on the cross of Christ and on the sins of the world. But he said at the close of the service, this young man announced, everyone, you need to come back tomorrow night. Because tomorrow night, I'm going to preach on the resurrection of Christ. After the crowd had dispersed, Dwight L. Moody grabbed the young man and he said, Look it, you may not be back tomorrow night. You don't know if God's going to give you another 24 hours. 
And he says a host of those people most definitely will not be back tomorrow night. And consequently, have only heard half the gospel. Now, I don't know what you think. Moody might have been a little rough on this young guy, but there is truth in what he says. The cross of Christ is only half the gospel. And half the gospel is not good news. Romans 4.25 says that Christ was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. You need both parts of the story to make it complete, to really make it the gospel. It's good news in that we can trust Jesus for being exactly who he claims to be. Christ even predicted his resurrection on a number of occasions, and pretty specifically and intimately with his disciples. That's why the angel said, remember? What's wrong with you? Can't you remember? In fact, in John 2, 19, Jesus said, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it again in three days. And I know that's kind of vague language, but in verse 21, he says the temple he spoke of was his body. He went ahead and identified it. Later on in his ministry, he spoke more plainly. For Matthew writes in Matthew 16, 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. If the resurrection did not happen, we have to admit that Jesus lied to us. And if Jesus lied to us, therefore he can't be trusted with any other promise or claims that he made. But the resurrection did happen. And we can, and we should believe in what he says. I mean, if a promise so true as the resurrection takes place, then everything else that comes forth from God's word, you need to hinge your faith on that, because his promises will be fulfilled. <coughs> we continue to read in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, these words, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. You know, faith in a dead man doesn't really do a whole lot, does it? Faith in a dead man can't save you. I want you to picture it this way. You're on your way somewhere, maybe home or somewhere you need to go, and out of nowhere appears a man with a knife in his hand, and he looks at you as if you're going to be his next victim. Now, if you're like me, I'm going to run as fast as I can, about 100 yards in time. But I'm going to take off running. I mean, if anybody's coming after me with a knife, you know, my mom didn't raise a dummy, and if she did, it was my sister. <laughs> I'm going to head down the road. So you're running down the road, and off to the left, you see a cemetery. And off to the right, there is a house with lights on. How many are going to run into the cemetery? Those that raise their hands, I really have a part for you to play in the next horror movie that's coming out. We won't run into the cemetery because dead people can't help us. You can cry all you want to dead people, and nothing's going to happen. You run to the house that has the lights on, hoping it's somebody's home, because living people can offer you help. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then he has no power then to save us. It's like running into a cemetery among the dead. Our faith is useless. But if the biblical account is true, which we here this morning believe it is, we can then find help in our time of need. We can find redemption. We can find salvation in the very one who has conquered sin, death, and Satan. So it is good news, my friends, and that's why we're here celebrating. But also, Easter brings hope. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, the Apostle Paul says, If only for this life we have hope in Christ. We are to be pitied more than all men. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, why bother going to church? You'd be better off someplace else. Now, don't anybody be able to leave. 
Don't anybody take that as, oh, okay, I guess the pastor's giving me permission to walk out. I have more of the story to share. Because if Christ had not been raised from the dead, why should I even bother preaching? I should go find myself another job. And if Christ had not been raised from the dead, why bother put money in the offering plate? You only give them to a lost cause. And notice how we took the offering before the message? <laughs> so you only have an option with this one? And if Christ was not raised from the dead, why would you, I, you and I even bother serving him? We're only wasting our time and our energy. If Christ has not been raised, why suffer for him? You're only causing yourself needless pain and misery. If Christ has not been raised, why tell others about him? You might as well just save your breath. And if Christ has not been raised, why sing songs about him? And didn't we sing some powerful songs this morning? I thank Brady who headed up our praise team today, the songs that were selected in the praise team for leading us in worship. But why would we even bother with all of this if Christ wasn't raised from the dead? You might as well sing songs about the Easter Bar. Here's how Alan Redpath sums up this passage. And I quote, If Christ has not risen, then our faith is empty, our preaching useless, and he has failed to deal with sin at all. If he has not been raised from the tomb, we are still in our sins, and all his promises are absolutely untrue. He is a fraud, an imposter, and the ashes are buried somewhere in Palestine today. There's no hope beyond the grave for anyone. And those who have died professing faith in him are just left there forever. But since Christ has been raised, the opposite's true. We can say since Jesus Christ is risen, our faith in him has eternal dividends. Our preaching converts. He has gained complete victory over sin. Since he's been raised from the tomb, we are saved from our sins, and all his promises are absolutely true. He is the Lord as he claimed to be, and is exalted in heaven today. There is hope beyond the grave for all who trust in him. And those who have died professing faith in him are rejoicing in heaven now. End of quote. You know, Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychiatry, wrote, and finally, there's the painful riddle of death, for which no remedy at all has yet been found, nor probably ever will be. Well, Sigmund, I have news for you. There is a remedy. It's been found. And Christians around the world have discovered it. How do we overcome death? Through a relationship with Jesus Christ, who he himself overcame death. Jesus said, because I live, you also will live from John 14, 16. We have put our confidence in the right place, and death no longer has its sting. Every year about this time, thousands of people climb a mountain in the Italian Alps. They pass what's entitled the Stations of the Cross, finally to stand at the crucifix, an outdoor crucifix. One tourist, however, noticed that there was a little trail that led beyond the cross. He walked through the rough thickets and to his surprise came upon another shrine, a shrine that symbolized the empty tomb. It was neglected. The brush had grown up around it. Almost everyone had gone just as far as the cross, but they stopped there. And so many people today are like that. They arrive at the cross. They've grown only despair and heartbreak. Far too few have gone beyond the cross to find the real message of Easter. The rest of the story. The message that the tomb is empty and that there is hope for all who put their faith in him. I would ask the praise team if they come to the platform right now. As they're making their way to the platform, Thomas Jefferson has always been known as a great man, one of the signers of the Declaration. However, you may not be aware that Thomas Jefferson just could not reconcile himself to the miracles that were described in Scripture. So he 
came up with his own Bible. He edited the Word of God, deleting out a lot of passages about the supernatural. He confined himself solely to the moral teachings of Jesus Christ. And when you come to the crucifixion, here's how he ends the Gospels, and I'm quoting, There they laid Jesus, and rolled a great stone at the mouth of the sepulcher, and departed. The end. My friend, you and I know that's not the end. That's not how the story goes. That's not the true account that the Bible <coughs> shares with us. Easter means good news. Ah, the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, great news for all of us in this room. But it also means hope. Guess what? When I die, I am not going to just decay in a grave. The Word of God says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I know where my eternity is. I know who holds my todays and my tomorrows. I will rise again just as Jesus promised. And so will you if your confidence is in Him. So as we stand together and we sing this last song of faith and also a song of consecration, if you need to do business with the Lord, the altar is always open for that. But I want us to leave victorious. I want us to leave with good news and hope as a message that goes before us.